Writer's Den. I'm your host, Jane Waters Thomas, and we're going to be speaking with a very interesting author today for sure. Jamie Beckett is from Winter Haven. You can often see him trailing out on his motorcycle, maybe flying an airplane, um, but we are going to be talking to him today about writing books and, and what he's been doing as an author um, since leaving public office. So welcome, Jamie. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure being here, Jane. Absolutely. Now, Jamie, a lot of your books are um, e-books, and, and they're, they're not printed material. Tell us a little bit about um, how you got into the market of ebooks, and then we're going to talk a little bit about some of what you're writing. Sure. Yeah, I actually like the e-format a lot. It's very expedient, and it really opens up the market, not, not just to people like me, but really anybody who wants to participate in the publishing industry. The e-book is the most expedient and least expensive way to do it, and even better than that, it's the easiest way to deliver to a customer. I was, uh, I was in a hotel a couple of years ago, and I was reading a book in the lobby on my iPad, and I finished the book. And it was right near the beginning of the vacation. I thought, oh, and I'm way far away from the store. And I realized, oh, wait, Amazon. And I, I just went on and I searched around. In about 10 minutes, I had a book I wanted, downloaded, and I'm into a new book. It's you know, great. And it's very interesting to me that um, we're not looking at populations and generations that you would just think automatically go to ebook that is going to ebook right now. It's it's everybody. We I, I'm oh, yeah. going into coffee shops or all over our county and, and the United States literally, and I'm seeing our seniors with their with their nooks and yeah. their reading. Um, it is just such a convenient way to take your your information with you on a plane wherever you're at. Whether it's on the reader side or whether it's on the publisher side or the writer side, mm -hmm. ebooks just they're so easy to do, and and you can update them as well. I, I talked to a friend the other day, an author from Maryland, and he's just gotten the electronic rights to a book he published a number of years ago, and he's going to put it out, but he's going to put it out in an updated version. It's a nonfiction book, so that's so easy to do in the e-market and you can even in a non-fiction book you can put out an update and people who purchased it previously get an email letting them know hey there's a new version of this that's a great tool that is a wonderful tool you know in in the world of of artistry um, there are often artists visual artists that have writers in their uh, contracts for art that they can come back at any time and mm -hmm. add to the painting that a private collector has just purchased. So this is kind of that, only in the writer's world. It really is, and, and you know, I have a background in the music business when I was a kid. I was a professional musician until I was 29, so it very much like the music business of the 50s, where the independent labels had all the really great acts. That's kind of where we are now. Self-publishing, e-publishing really is as competitive as being with a big publisher. Absolutely, and and you mentioned that you were in the music industry for quite some time, and I and, had hair. You know, <laughs> yeah, you hung out with some pretty cool people. You know, I was looking at your Facebook and kind of looking through some of the photos, and I thought, oh, this guy is the real deal. Not only does he write, fly planes, drive motorcycles, he hangs out with really cool rock stars. I've been really, really lucky in my life, and I had a band when I was uh, in my early twenties that actually did pretty well. We moved to New York City to get famous, and it didn't work out, but man, it was a great experience. And I, I did get to hang out with Lil Steven and Keith Richards, and I avoided Ozzy Osbourne for a week. I'm still proud of that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. I bet he would have been an entire book that you could have written about. <laughs> yeah, I think so. <laughs> yes. So I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the books that you've written. You know, fiction seems to be where you fly in the world, um, in no book pun form, intended. Yeah, I, I uh, like fiction. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, I'd asked you um, uh, prior to coming on the show today about burritos and gasoline. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about burritos and gasoline and um, what this book is about. Absolutely, you know, the the best rule for any writer is write what you know, and because I'm a pilot primarily. I spent two years writing a book about domestic terrorists who hijacked five airplanes on the same day. That was 2000 and 2001. When September 11th happened, it became clear you can't publish that book because it, it's right. disrespectful and it's derivative. And so I, I really took about six months to recoup and I started thinking about what's a really simple story? And because I have a background as a musician, Burritos and Gasoline is basically the story of two guys who were best friends in high school and had a dream of being popular musicians mm -hmm. and being on Ed Sullivan and all that, but they have a falling out. And one of them spends his life trying to protect himself from any emotional harm by cutting himself off. So the book opens up when he thinks he's at rock bottom. 
He's not. We get to watch him write it down. But it's really a story of self-discovery and redemption and the realization that anybody can turn their life around if you choose to. Wonderful. And now you have a series of fictional books, and I'm just going to hold this up because this is an e-book, and um, it is uh, to the lifeboats. And this is one of how many? How five. many? It's one of five. It's the lifeboat adjust a series, it, and it's a, my son actually suggested writing sci-fi, which I'd never done. So I made a conscious decision. It's a series of five novellas that go together. Any one of them stand, is a standalone, but the last chapter of each is the first chapter of the next. So it's kind of like a 1950s serial okay. where you follow through. But it's basically the story of uh, an extinction event, kind of like what killed the dinosaurs, we think. Uh -huh. If the world knew that was coming, we now have the technology to leave. Not all of us, but some of us. And the lifeboats are three huge lifeboats in space where basically the seed crop of humanity goes to survive the impact and come back. The problem is all the issues you had as people on ground, you have as people in space. So, and, and really, fiction, at least for me, it's always about people. Right. Whatever the setting is, it's always about relationships and conflict and resolutions. Wonderful. Well, and, and you're, you're, watch, you're a people watcher. I mean, being a musician, being an author, being a politician, um, <laughs> all of those things mean that you're paying attention to what's going on in society and in social environments, human behavior, those kind of things typically um, make your personality type click. Um, well, life fascinates me. The, the fact that people make the choices they do in life, the good ones and the bad ones and how we recover and how we enjoy ourselves, it just all fascinates me. How much of, of some of the fun life experiences have you had that you notice that you're actually writing into your fiction? A lot. A lot. I've gotten the question quite a bit about burritos and gasoline because there's musicians and road trips and I'm I'm kind of famous for that. Although I'm a pilot, I don't fly commercials. So if I have to go to California, I either take the motorcycle to the car, I make an adventure out of it. I get a lot of questions from people, is that me? Is the character really me? And it's not. But the places in the book actually exist. And, and many of those experiences really happen. Um, there's an old country store Mm -hmm. in the book, which actually existed when I was a little kid. It's gone now, but I remember going there when I was a little kid, and it's funny because I'm 56 in 2015, and I remember a time when my granny would give me 30 cents and send me off to the store to get cigarettes. And I can distinctly remember being four years old and reaching up to the counter to put a quarter and a nickel up, and I'd say, I need a pack of red Pall Malls. <laughs> and, the, and the man would look over and he'd say, oh, you're Queenie's boy. And, and he'd give me cigarettes. How funny, that's not happening <laughs> no, today. No. no. <laughs> but that's the great part, you know, life changes over time and, and our mores change. Mm -hmm. And if you kind of make little mental notes and you, you register those things, you have a story to tell. And, and amazingly, your story resonates with other people who say, I remember that, I forgot about that. But yeah, that used to be the way things were. Right, so when you sit down and you write a book, um, there, there's much that goes into that. And, and for those viewing the show today, it, it's not just we sit down and we write all of our thoughts out on a piece oh, of no. paper. <laughs> no, there's a little bit of research. There's, there's a lot of detail that has to be very, very um, factual, even in a fictional book. You know, my kids have seen me write because I work at home. I have an office at home, and I've been writing professionally for over 20 years. It's how I support myself. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a dictionary and a thesaurus going for me when I'm writing. You're right, you do a lot of research to make th sure things are actually accurate and true. And whether that's geographical research or you want to know about the people of an area or it doesn't matter, whatever the technology of the time is. Fiction is a great thing because you can suspend physical law, you can do anything you want, but it has to remain consistent throughout the story. You know, all of a sudden, George Washington can't walk into the room unless time travel is part of your story. So, yeah, it's a, it's a process, and you have to like it. You have to enjoy it because a lot of people think you sit down and you write a book and you turn it in and just piles of money come in. The reality is you write a book and you leave it alone for a little while and you go back and read it and realize how awful it is. <laughs> and you start scratching things out and adding things in and then you have to have a really good beta reader and I'm lucky there are a number of really good authors and editors here in Polk County. Mm -hmm. And I, I have a couple people where I'll give my work to and they're honest with me. They're not tell telling me I did a great job. They'll say, gee, this character's not filled out well, or I, I don't understand why that is. Mm -hmm. There's actually a, a, a character in Burritos and Gasoline fairly early in the story, in the first third, that seems inconsequential, but there's this huge description of them, and you don't understand why. And 
becomes clear later in the book, but in my initial draft, I left out an important sentence, just one sentence. And I had a couple beta readers say, this doesn't make any sense why this is here. And I went back, and, oh, because there's a piece of information you don't have. You add that one sentence in and it changes everything. So yeah, you really, it's a process. It's an art form. Mm -hmm. it, it's like any other art form. You have to work at it and be critical. And, and I don't want to say you can't have thin skin, but you've got to accept criticism and you've got to invite criticism because that's how you get better. That is that is true, absolutely, and I think that for every author that I've spoken with and, and for all of the interviews that we've done um, with the Writer's Den, that is the one thing that I hear consistently from authors is that, man, we've got to have the truth when, when we're getting an edit because we count on that to make it the best possible product. And, and you've got to have a truth, and you've got to have a truth that the reader relates to. I don't write about aviation mm -hmm. in my fiction, although To the Lifeboats is all in space, so there's some aeronautical stuff. But less than a half a percent of the general population is pilots. Mm -hmm. They can't relate to that, so I don't write that story. I write things that it doesn't matter where you come from, what your background is, you can read them and say, I, I've seen this situation. I know a person like that. I know what this is about. And, and that's the part that makes it accessible, whether it's Star Wars in space or John Wayne out in the desert. You go, I know those people. I know right. that personality type. Absolutely. Now, you've been writing. This is your career. This is this yeah. is how you make things fly in the world. Totally accidental, and, um, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> that's always the best story. I just want you to know. That's always the best story. Um, doing this full time, what happens when you hit a writer's block? You know, I'm lucky. I've never had a writer's block. Oh, what a and I don't know why that is, because I hear other people struggle with it. I, although I will say I have a secret weapon. I, I learned long ago that if I do something really boring, like mow the lawn, where my brain is not engaged, it'll wander. Mm -hmm. And so if I know I have to write tomorrow and I don't know what I'm going to write, I literally go wash the car or mow the lawn or something like that, and I'll know where I'm going after that. I just need some time to muddle it so through. So instinctively, you take a few minutes to do something mundane and you're back yeah, on track. I'm really lucky that way, and, and I really am lucky, but I've never... You know, I write a column every week for a national aerospace pro mm -hmm. publication. I write fiction virtually every day. I've never, ever had a day in over 20 years where I had no idea what I was going to write. You know, tell us about the very first book that, that you published, the very first book that was ever done, and what that looked like in your mind when it was happening. Well, I hate to say this. The very first thing I ever published was in my junior year of high school because I had this great teacher, Mark Cohan, and he had this history class and he told us, you know what, instead of just listening to me talk, you're going to write a history book. And he had us do it as a class project. I still have it. And, and you know, this was in the days of mimeograph machines and things and we actually had to learn how to set type and the whole thing. It was a great experience. It really was, even though it didn't, obviously it didn't sell, it was just for the class. Mm -hmm. But it was an important thing in my life because I got to see, you can make something, you can take an idea and turn it into a tangible product mm -hmm. if you're willing to work in a group and make something happen. It, it's, it's really a powerful thing because I think music and publishing are, are two areas where even as a teenager you have the power to do this if you choose to. And, and that was really a, a formative thing for me when I switched from writing music on a regular basis to writing books. It's still storytelling. It's still I want to say what I want to say, but I want to find a way to say it in a way that's palatable to you. Mm -hmm. And that's a great challenge. I really enjoy that. Absolutely. So do you dabble in poetry? You know, I don't really. I did it one time, but uh, John Davis, Poet Laureate of, of Winterhaven, is a friend of mine, and he's so much more talented than I am at that. I just figured, you know what, I'll stick to what I'm good at, let John do what he's good right. at, and <laughs> that'll be good. I'm going to write, he's going to poet, he's going to do <laughs> all of the poetry. Well, that makes sense, and you know, I, I just, I'm always interested to know what the other arts are. Um, typically, authors are um, just well versed in many other art forms, you know, from painting to music as you are. You well, know. I do have 10 guitars in my office. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I play guitar almost every day. Not because I have to, I just mm -hmm. really enjoy it and I still enjoy it. My children don't, ironically enough, because I still play like a professional musician. So I'll play the same song 30 times in a row 
because I'm trying to get my little finger to do something, and they're tired of hearing it. <laughs> they're ready for you to mow the lawn right. or so do when something I, else. <laughs> when uh, Nat West will occasionally invite me to come downtown and play in Winter Haven, and I do, I go out on the street and I play, and I keep my guitar case closed because people try and give me money, and I'm like, no, no, former commissioner, I'm not looking for right. a job, I'm right. okay. <laughs> right. But no, I, you're right, I think the arts get into your soul. Mm -hmm. It's something that really fulfills you, and when I was a kid in a band, it was the greatest feeling in the world. And I still enjoy that, getting email from people who've read the books. You know, just recently, for reasons I have no idea, um, my books have started selling in England and France. And because of the internet and everything, you can track this stuff. I have no idea why. I've never done any marketing there. I've never done an interview there. But it's one of the things that really makes you feel like, you know what, the work I do is entertaining people. And that's well, the whole point. touching people. So Absolutely. I'm happy. That's wonderful, absolutely. I mean, we all read because we, we want to be entertained or we want to have more knowledge, you know? And if what you're doing is, is selling across the globe, that's gotta be very fulfilling. It is, and I, I think so, maybe part of it is, although my books seem to cover a lot of ground there in different settings and things, and I'm working on a new one now that starts in Manhattan and ends in Key West. It's a good story, you'll like it. Very cool. But. Uh, you know, they're really mostly about self-discovery because it's the one thing as I get older in life I really notice people spend an inordinate amount of their time trying to be like everybody else and they realize very late in life nobody's like anybody else. Just yeah. be you. Be a decent person. And, and frankly, one of the themes of burritos and gasoline is no matter how downtrodden you are, no matter how low on the socioeconomic scale you are, there's somebody you can help. Mm -hmm. and, and Finances have nothing to do with it. You can make somebody's life better. And the amazing thing is if you actually take a moment and try and help somebody else, you start to feel better. It, and it's an odd cycle. Mm -hmm. So if you can get into that cycle of giving and caring and trying to make other people's lives better, amazingly, your life gets better. It is, it's just so wonderful. That's one of those things I really enjoy. I write about that a lot. And I think it resonates with people to tell you the truth. I think they wanna know it's not just a, a nice story, mm -hmm. that's real. Right. If you actually go out and help somebody, your life will get better. I wanna ask you a question about how your time in politics, or if your time in politics and in, in government shifted anything in, in your writing. Did you notice a change at all from, because you were in music, mm -hmm. you know, living the life of a pilot and, and being you know, an author and, all those things that look fantasyful to us and exciting to us, and not that politics is not, but it's a much different place on the planet. And it I is. would think it would have had such a different influence during that time in your writing. You know, it, it's it's interesting. I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I'm that odd little group of American men. I never had to register for the draft. I was never at risk. Although we were in Vietnam when I was in kindergarten, we were still there when I was a freshman in high school. The backlash of that, if you recall, was pretty severe. I never had to do anything to be an American. I was just lucky and skated along. Maybe because of that, I really believe, and maybe this is dull for people, but I really believe in, in the participatory system of government we have. Um, I ran once for city commission many years ago. I lost. I learned an enormous amount through that procedure. I ran once and I won and I served and I was very proud to do it. I encourage people all the time to run for office, at any level of office, if it's something you want to do. The thing you notice when you get in there, most people in office, they really came to do something good. Mm -hmm. They believe in, in helping and participating and doing something. Sometimes they get over their heads. Sometimes they deal in a situation where there is no right answer, and that's a big thing to remember in politics. We tend to polarize people into the left and the right, and we have to be mad at each other. Everything is subjective. It's mm -hmm. just what we accept and agree to do now. The life we lead now and the structure we live under is, bears little resemblance to 1950 right. and no resemblance to 1900. It's okay to disagree with people. It's okay to say, you know, you strongly believe we should fund that project and I believe we shouldn't. That doesn't mean either of us is a bad person. Mm -hmm. So as long as we can remain respectful of each other, doesn't mean we'll always be calm, but as long as we can be respectful and say, you know, there's no malice there. It's just a different perspective. How do I understand it? I enjoyed that part very much. It is hard serving in office. I'm glad I did it. I'm not sure I would do it again, but I, I would never say I wouldn't do it again because mm -hmm. I thought 
we did some good work while I was there. So I'm glad I served. I'm glad to have more free time now, mm -hmm. but I think everybody should do it. And, and I don't care what your political persuasion is. If you want to serve, if you want to see something different, run. So as you went into office, um, you know, coming in and, and as you said, skating in with, with that belief system, um, do you feel like you came, you went in with that feeling and so it really didn't have any effect on what you were doing in writing? When you look at materials pre-office to after office, do you see any kind of shift? I think if I had won when I originally ran, I ran when I was 40, if okay. I had won then, I think it would have had a big change. Mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to, to win elective office when I was 50 years old. Mm -hmm. I really knew who I was by that point in life. And, and you know, it's okay that it takes you 20, 30, 40 years to find yourself. Mm -hmm. But by then I had a pretty good strong value system and, and I'm, I'm pleased to say my value system is flexible enough. I'm comfortable with you having a completely different view than I am. Mm -hmm. and, and we can still be friends and I could still learn something from you. The, the key is to get to that point where you don't need to fight with people you disagree with. Right. So in that sense, I don't think it affected my writing a lot because things I wrote before being published, be, before being elected are still similar to the things I write now where I really believe the most powerful force on the planet is you. Right. You can change your world and that's enough. Mm -hmm. You don't have to force other people to do something. If you do something good and you become an example, You've made your contribution. Well, you know, I've seen you be such an advocate in, in the Polk County community for music. As you mentioned mm. earlier in the interview, you know, hanging out in the park and playing and being, you're not paying me. I'm here, right. I'm here for you. Um, as an advocate and that's sort of your personality type in, in what you do, which is fabulous, um, what would you say to the new generation of writers that are, that are just coming out of high school right now um, because they're definitely coming into a world that was different than you went into as oh, yeah. a writer? Yeah. Um, you know what? Be bold and be willing to fail. There, there is no way you can get into the arts without failing a lot. Um, as a musician, I've been on the stage. Sometimes it just doesn't work. It, it's just it's not a good night. You learn from that process. Mm -hmm. Writing. You know, it doesn't matter if I write an article, 500 word article for a magazine or if I'm writing a full size book, it's not golden. It needs to be tweaked, it needs to be polished, it needs to be gone over. And you know, whether you're a writer, you're a musician, whatever, you need to do the work, just like any other craft. The more you do the work, the better facility you have for doing the work and the more you'll find what it is you're trying to do. That's why Stevie Ray Vaughan was completely different than Roy Clark, great guitar players, Mm -hmm. but they're doing something different. Picasso is different than Monet. They, they're trying to express something, but in a different way. You have mm -hmm. to take some time and find out who you are. The only way you can do that is just do the work. Right, absolutely. You've already done so many wonderful books. Um, your work is selling literally worldwide at this point. You're a full-time author, musician, pilot. You've, you've had an incredible life thus far. You're going to have an incredible life all the way out, I'm sure. What are you looking forward to in your upcoming work? You know, this is going to sound odd to you, but I really like getting older. My perspective changes as I get older, and, and of course, like everybody, when I was 22, I knew everything. <laughs> now I'm 56. I'm pretty sure I'm reasonably stupid, but I observe <laughs> well. And as I get older, in all honesty, I like it more, and it's partially being male. Um, being male, when we're young, we feel we can overpower anything. We, we can just muscle our way through. And as you get older and maybe a little weaker and maybe your belly's not as flat and your hair's not as thick, you start to realize, you know, it might be okay to just take a step back and analyze this situation before I jump into the fray. And I like that. So I, I sort of look forward to getting older and seeing how life changes. You know, I'm, I'm very lucky. My kids are grown now. I've only got one left at home and she'll be gone soon. And, and to tell you the truth, it's a huge, huge point of pride as you see your children grow up and become real people mm -hmm. who make their own decisions. Not all what you would have made, but that part's great and I suspect that is going to change my perspective and what I write because as I segue into my elder years, I'm no longer an active participant in the world as much and I'm more of an observer. And that could be an interesting thing, so I'm looking forward to that. We certainly look forward to what you have in the upcoming years. We know it's going to be very exciting. We're going to direct our viewers to find you online at jamiebeckett with two T's dot com for more information and on ordering these great books that we've talked about today.
Thank you so much, Jane. This has been terrific. I really enjoyed it. That's going to wrap us up today at the Writer's Den. Thank you so much for coming, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.